we were in that hustle phase, just grinding, trying to get it off the ground. And then we had our friends helping. We were doing like events and expos. I remember buying like 5,000 wristbands from China that we were trying to use. Man, for like we did everything wrong. Gorilla marketing. Merch, merch, yeah, and like that. T-shirts. So funny, so we many We had lessons. this cartoon character made. We did a lot of like, you know, entrepreneur stuff and wasted a lot of time and money Man, really early on. And then ultimately, it failed and it led Kim into kind of a, a really dark place. This is Startup to Storefront. Today's guests are Kim and Tim Lewis, co-founders of Curl Mix, a brand focused on clean beauty hair products for, you guessed it, curly hair. This is the second company that they've started together, but they'll be the first to tell you that their first one was a failure. Still, they grew from the experience and attribute the success of Curl Mix to the lessons learned from that first failed business. As you'll learn in this episode, Kim and Tim are innovative, driven, and work exceptionally well together. We've had a few founders on this show before who are married, and it's always immediately apparent why both the marriage and the company are successful. Kim and Tim perfectly complement each other's skill sets and have such an infectious energy that it's a no-brainer why they were chosen to appear on not one, but two TV shows. So listen in as we cover everything from how they funded their first company on Tim's winnings from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, how they grew Curl Mix's sales from $140,000 to $1 million in only one year, and why it's so important for them to be the entrepreneurial role models they never had while growing up in Chicago's South Side. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have the founders of Curl Mix. Either one of you can take this. Just give listeners, what is Curl Mix? Curl Mix is a clean beauty brand for curly hair. We focus on women who want to wear their hair in its natural curly state. We usually, at this time, I usually ask you how you got started, but I read your, a little bit about just your bio, the About Us page on your website. And there's some very interesting information on there that <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of want to open with. And so let's just start on at what point of your life did you guys really want to dive into entrepreneurship or want to want to start a company? It might have not been curl mix, but just wanted to jump into entrepreneurship. I will say that I am not a natural entrepreneur not by any means. Kim is the risky one, the entrepreneurial one. I think, but it started for, but for us in college. I didn't really even consider entrepreneurship until my senior year in college. I think I read the four hour work week and I was like, <laughs> I'm like a pretty easy life. Let me, you know, let me try this out. And that's when I got interested in it. But even then I'm still, I still wasn't like built to be an entrepreneur. I'm a natural procrastinator at heart. I overanalyze everything, you know, and Kim is just like, you know, done is better than perfect. Let's jump into it and we'll figure out the details. So Yeah, and I think we first kind of got introduced to it at a professor who came to teach my business entrepreneurship class, Entrepreneurship 101. And he had took the kids on like a, a trip abroad and he bought like a Ferrari in Italy and had it shipped back. And I was like, well, where did they do that? I was like, how, <laughs> the, well, how do you have that kind of money? And then I remember asking him, I was like, you know. That's such an interesting flex. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> And then um, I was like, do you have your PhD? Like, you know, you're teaching a class. He said, oh, no, I'm a guest lecturer. I was like, what? I was like, hold up. I was like, you know, when you're a successful entrepreneur, you get to skip all the lines and you don't have to follow any of the rules because they invited him back to teach. He did not have a PhD. He buying cars overseas, shipping them back. And so that was my first introduction. But then after that, in senior year, we had a class. We uh, went to a talk on social entrepreneurship and they were talking about like apps and tech stuff. And so, and at the same time I was taking my first IT class and my teacher was like, you're gonna build an app and want you to wireframe it. And so that was our first, just hearing about entrepreneurship. And then we started our first business, which is a social network for natural hair. It ultimately failed. Uh, we did that for about a year and a half, but mm -hmm. we didn't really make any money. And the first shift we got, it was for like space on our website. Like yeah, we, we saw one ad of the year and a half we were in business. We saw one ad for $250. Um, which is like after we had sunk probably 25,000 into the business in app that we were doing. Yeah. And so the way that I can tell you about how that got started, we left school 2013, summer 2013, got married, um, moved into our own place. Kim had a full-time job and then I had an internship. I didn't get the full-time offer for my internship. So she was the only one working. And 
at that point in time, she realized that she hated her job, her full-time job. She would come home crying, would be stressed out every single day. And she's like, you know what? I want to do the app business that we had thought about when we were back in school. And I was like, yeah, Kim, let's go for it. You know, what do you need? Like, we need about $25,000 to get it built and get it started because we weren't tech people. And so I was like, well, we, we got to save up for that or figure something out. And then that's why I was like, no, you're going to go on Who Wants to be a Millionaire? And then he was like, that's ridiculous. And I was like, no. You- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a, a linear train of thought by any means. Not, not at all. I, I was like, uh, no, you're nuts. That's not a way to raise money. There's just a lottery. They're not going to pick me. This is a waste of our time. Let's try to like he's the get a loan person. or raise VC. He's the kind of person. That summer, we were watching a lot of Who Wants to be a Millionaire. And Tim would answer every single question right. Every oh. single you have you ever sat next to somebody who knew the answer to every one of those questions? Yeah, no. for sure. And so and I was like, okay, you have to go on the show. So I looked up how to apply, and I saw that the tapings were in New York. I like booked him a ticket. Yeah, um, I, I, let me let me be wow. real. I'm not telling the details. I came back home from work one day. I walk in. She didn't get a hello. She was like. I booked your ticket to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. <laughs> I got you the hotel. The tryout is at this time. You're going. And it wasn't a conversation. It was a commandment. So I like, yes, dear. Uh, we'll just keep rolling. Then he got on the show, and he ended up winning $100,000. So really, 80 after tax. Wait, so on the show, so when you get to the $100,000, right? So you, did you answer it? And then you got, did you get the phone a friend? What lifeline are you on? Give me a sense okay, of where yeah, you're I'll, at. I'll, I'll yeah, I definitely continue. skipped all of that because it's, that was like maybe two months between getting on the show and actually getting the check. So yes, actually, we're skipping out on a pretty crazy detail. So before even getting on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, we were trying to win pitch competitions with that idea. Okay, um, I didn't. We didn't find out we got Who Wants to Be a Millionaire until we had lost a pitch competition. We came in fifth place and weren't going to move on to the finals. Right after we got the news that we had lost the pitch competition, it was at a conference in Houston. Then we were out in the hallway. They was like, what happened? It was like, we just found out we're going to be a home wants to be a millionaire. And they were like, we just lost. Is everything okay? It was like, no, it's cool. It's, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I got on the show. Uh, I answered the first, I had, out of the first 10 questions or so, I answered eight of them and I used a couple lifelines because my goal really was only to win $25,000. I was playing really conservatively. I was oh, like, Kim wow. just needs. $25,000. Let me just try to get $25,000. You know, with trivia is really random. You never know if you're going to know it or not. So right. I'm trying to win $25,000. So within the first four or five questions, I got in the $25,000. I think I was up to 64000 before I, I used my first lifeline. And so I was like, I was trying to play really, really conservative because I knew that after 10 questions, you get a guaranteed 25 k So my whole goal was to make it through the first 10 questions. After we did that, I started using all the lifelines, just trying to keep going. Um, but I actually walked away at the $250,000 question after getting the $100,000 question correct, because I didn't know it. I God. can give it to you. Too I, much to it, risk. It haunts Too my dreams. Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Tell me what that yeah. question was. It was like the, the main character of The Catcher in the Rye appeared in mm. a magazine, I believe it was Variety Magazine, in an article a year prior to the publishing of the book. What was the name of the article that the character appeared in? And I was like, yeah. And it had all kinds of answers. Like, it had like, this sandwich, sandwich has, has no mayonnaise. mayonnaise. Which was the correct answer. <laughs> I have no idea. But it was all wow. kind of random yeah, stuff. Of random How stuff. random is that question? Yeah, I have <laughs> no idea. So I was like, no, I didn't. I wish I would have saved one lifeline to skip that one, because I think I could have gotten to the million or half a million. But 100,000 was cool because that's, uh, outside of 250, that's the one that they give you completely upfront. So you just get a check for $100,000. So that was really cool to get like six weeks later, end up getting that's the check awesome. in the mail. And then we didn't cash it for like the first two weeks. We were like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I've never seen this amount of money. It's going to bounce. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> ABC Finally. is just going to bounce a check. Yeah, oh we're two gosh. kids from the south side of Chicago. I had never, never seen that many zeros anywhere. Um, before, so we, it took us a little while to cash it. So it seems like it was a pretty straightforward point to walk away with that $100,000 because you had already 4 x what you had originally set out to go there for because, you know, this was, this was not just some arbitrary, oh, let's see if we can make some money. This was 
your attempt at fundraising for your company. So when you were sitting in that hot seat, was there ever a moment in your mind where you were like, just take a guess and maybe this will, like before you got to the 100,000, was there a moment where you, where you thought to walk away earlier than that because you had already surpassed the 25K goal? Actually, no. The first, the first few questions, I, I knew them. There was one that I skipped that I really did not know. You could get like two skips and a 50-50 uh, back when I did it. And so I skipped one question that I really didn't know, but I knew the rest. And then I used a, the 50-50 on one that I thought, like I knew that I knew, I said it, I said, this is what I think the answer is. I had read it somewhere in an article, but I wasn't sure. It was like the maximum age, what, what social media platform has like the maximum age set at 99. And I was like, I think it's Facebook because there was like an article about a hundred year old person being ineligible for Facebook <laughs> now. Um, but it was like, I was like, there's no way that that's real. But cause, and I didn't know what Instagram was at the time. And I was like, maybe it's Instagram <laughs> or Facebook. So new. I'm pretty sure it's Facebook. Um, so I took the 50-50 and then they eliminated Instagram. So I was like, okay, yeah, so it's definitely Facebook. But we said that if you had, I was like, Tim, if it's anything under this, just go for it. Mm -hmm. like, we had a certain amount. Okay. If it's anything under 50,000, just go for it. It's okay if we don't yeah. get it. If you lose that, but that if you point, get you to 100, a thousand. if you get to 100, don't take anything. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one, one thing you mentioned at the beginning around the Ferrari. So for me, when I was a kid, I had like, uh, everyone's got like a rich uncle or something that at some point, right? And I remember getting in, the BM, in a BMW, I might have been like 10 years old or something. And it was a seven series and I was in the back seat. And for the first time in my life, I had grabbed, you know, the oh shit handle and I grabbed <laughs> it and I'm just like holding on to it. And then I let it go. And in every car I had been in prior to that moment, the thing just slaps up. It goes pop and it hits the car. And for the first time in my life, I let it go and it just, it just gradually goes up. Like there's a little air piston in it and I was floored and I thought, what does this guy do? How do I replicate that money so I can buy vehicles like this? And mm -hmm. it was like this moment in my life where it was like, I just need to piece it together, whether it's education, whether it's entrepreneur, whatever it is, I am now following this, this thing because I want this car. And similar to the Ferrari story, it sounds like, right? Where it's like the seed of, oh, you're a guest lecturer. Oh, you don't have a P. Yeah. And these things are like super powerful motivators at an early age, um, yeah. at least for me. This exposes you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we both grew up on the south side of Chicago. There, there's almost no entrepreneurs in our family or in our network that we knew prior to, like, you know, prior to learning about it literally in school. So there weren't a lot of like examples that we could choose from. It was always, you know, some, somebody on TV and this is kind of unrealistic. So we were both like, oh, let's get jobs, you know, go to college, get good jobs. You know, maybe one day you'll save enough to be rich and take vacations and all that stuff. But like after we had these experiences, we're like, you know what, for Kim, entrepreneurship was the only way. I could survive being in an office. She couldn't. It's kind of the antithesis of who she is is like a it's not even no i didn't know if it was just me my manager my first manager was terrible mm. he told me I'm I the same way kim I'm, I'm right there with you literally like if you guys hired me today you'd fire me tomorrow you'd say diego clearly thinks he can run this way better than anyone and that's at any level you could hire me to be a janitor and i'd be like everything's clean but let me let me take it let me i looked at the whiteboard and i saw some some ideas that aren't really clicking and it's just a problem and you know i've, I've learned that about myself pretty early on where it's like, if I'm not in control, it's not usually a good thing. My manager would tell me how bad I was in my job every day. I wasn't bad in my job, but he didn't like training. He was training me to be his supervisor. So yeah. he told me that I sucked for three months every single day. Literally, you're terrible at your job and you're never going to make it here. And I was working at like a grocery train. A train. So I'm like, I definitely could have done the job. You know, he just, so that I was like, I can't stay here. And that's when I started looking into entrepreneurship. <laughs> Well, good for you to for you to notice that and not get down on yourself and be like, no, this dude's crazy. It's definitely not me. So let's go back. So what a crazy story. You said 25,000. You go on, who wants to be a millionaire? You get your $100,000. You get your check in the mail. You hold on to it. At some point you cash it. Now what? Now you go right into the app building? Yeah. So we went to, um, well, no, I was still working at a, so I worked at that job. I was making 70 K a year. I left that job before we got the money. So there was about a yeah, month and the a half. Monday, the Monday we came back from who wants to be a millionaire. We hadn't got the money yet. 
they chewed me out for going. They yeah. so because I ended up getting to a meeting like five minutes before it started, and they wanted me to be there an we hour. We drove. Early. We drove back from New York overnight to get her there five minutes late for her Monday morning meeting, and she got in trouble. For I got chewed out. It's like you shouldn't have went. Um, they were like, I miss dinner dates with my wife all the time, and I was like, this is not a dinner wow. date. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know what? It's okay. So I uh, I ended up leaving. And then we took about $15,000 of that money and we, we bought a camera. We put some money towards the app getting built. We spent a lot of money um, with the developer who kind of played us really um, mm-hmm. because we could have just built the site on a WordPress for like 300 bucks. Yeah, we wasted about $7,000 on that first version. Of mm, the it wasn't app. seven. Tim was making up all the details, not, y'all. It was about, <laughs> making it was about up all seven up. total. We spent about 3000 because I think the guy was mm-hmm. in India. And then okay. after we had spent that money, <laughs> I paid the I paid the bill. <laughs> you have to factor in your time and energy, all that. It went into it. And so, um, <laughs> but we had bought a camera because I was thinking, we were doing that. We were a content site. If you're going to be social, mm-hmm. no, we get to make content. So we were making a lot of content right. like that. So we ended up investing maybe 15000 and then ended up making, making this out on WordPress for like 300 bucks. And then... At that point, when I was still working this time, and Tim was working at Starbucks. Yeah. So even though we had a check, it wasn't like we weren't working. We were still like working our jobs. You worked at a photo studio. I worked at Starbucks. I was doing eight twenty-five. She was doing ten dollars an hour. Yes. <laughs> so we were we were in that hustle phase, just grinding, trying to get it off the ground. Yes. Um, and then we had our friends helping. We were doing like events and expos. I remember buying like 5,000 wristbands from China that we were trying to use. Man, for like we gr- did everything wrong. Gorilla marketing. Merch, merch, yeah, like and that. T-shirts. So funny, so we many lessons. We had this cartoon character made. We did a lot of like, you know, entrepreneur stuff and wasted a lot of time and money Man, really and early on. And then ultimately it failed and it led Kim into kind of a, a really dark place. But at, at that point in time, I had gotten a new job making like 150K. And so we were we were in a good space, but the business was failing. And so she wanted um, something different, something more to do. And that's when we kind of developed the idea for Curl Mix. So after the Natural Hair Academy went belly up, we knew that the next business that we were gonna start needed to, number one, make money on day one because we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna do any more like ad companies, content, all this stuff, do a lot of work without getting paid for it right away. And then the second thing, it needed to be basically product-based, so it can be divorced from our time. So whether it was a productized service mm-hmm. or a product, um, we wanted to make sure it was divorced from our time because we, we didn't want to have another repeat of that first failed business. So we tried to learn as much as possible from that failure. Honestly, I, I went to business school as someone who went to business school and fought it the whole time. It was dumb. I was like, why am I here? I'm wasting money. I would literally, like if I was in business school and you said, why are you here? I would say, it's a cop out. I would literally, like, I knew it was a cop out. I knew I was in a place in my life where I had, I had just started a company. And so it was kind of like, you know, the way I put it in my head was, well, I'm in business school and everything I learn, I can, I can sandbox on my company. That's like how I rationalized it. But honestly, it was just a cop out. It was a complete waste of, of time. And I had, you know, it's, it's weird. I had classmates that would come up to me and say, you know, 95% of startups fail, right? Like you're going to fail. Like they classmates of mine. And I would just always say like, one, for sure you, you're a hater and I'll never talk to you again. Like you've just told me what camp you're in, thank you. And two, it's like, it's really important to know that you create your own data. It's super important in, any, in anything, right? It doesn't matter how you grew up, you know, it doesn't matter anything. It's like you create your own data. And this is, you know, that's really why like I'm against, I'm against statistics because they can really play a role in your head. Like, oh, like my mom's a single parent. And so it's like, I'm a Latino single parent guy. You know, if I look on the map, I'm at best a GM at McDonald's, according to national data. And there's a problem. There's an inherent problem with that because I think it does play with people's psyche. So for me, I was like, you got to create your own data. At what point in terms of your app, did you know it failed? Was it just like nothing was happening or like what was the, the signal that this isn't working? We basically realized we were competing with Facebook and Instagram. And okay. so we had, we realized that Women love to talk to, they love to showcase their hair, not talk to other women about their hair. So it's like, I don't want to connect with you about my problems that I'm having or this conditioner or whatever. I don't necessarily even want product recommendations. What I want to do is make my hair cute and take a picture and show you how cute my hair is. And when I, and so we couldn't get people to come back every day. And mm-hmm. we were we had like over a thousand users or whatever on the social network, but it wasn't- That's pretty good. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think about it, so I think context is important here. So we're talking 2013, 2014. At that time, the yeah. App Store was yeah, a brand yeah, yeah. new thing, right? I mean, Blackberries were still, uh, <laughs> like they, they held market share still at that time. And so for you to have a thousand users on any social media app, I mean, that's, that's pretty good at that time. Oh, wow. I well, appreciate thanks. if you had told us that back then, we probably would have kept going. And we didn't make no money. And that was the other thing. I was like, we don't, this is not a revenue generating business. I can't hire people or even feed myself with this. Tim was just having to be making a six figure job or working a six figure job while I was doing it. And that's the only way that it allowed me to do it. Mm-hmm. But we also realized we're going to have to make content to get them coming back every day. That meant I need yeah. to be putting out something 365 days a year. And I was like, if I can't pay people to have them make the content, then this is not a business and this doesn't really work. And so I either need to one, get more ad revenue so that I can pay people to make content, but even still, that's not a lot of money for a lot of work, you know, content yeah. 300 days a year. So I was just like, you know what? I need to come up with something else and mm-hmm. I just closed the business. And at that time I had learned like photography, web design, like you learn so much, you know, so it wasn't a complete wash. And I also made a ton of connections in the hair industry because I was producing content for professionals in the industry. So stylists and influencers or whatever. So chemists, yeah. And so I was like, so I had a lot, a lot of education about the industry and connections at that point. And so at this point you think, all right, cool. We need to create, you're solving for a lot of the things that you are trying to, like you realize these things don't work according to this business. Let me go ahead and solve for them. And so now you're, entering a product that people can use all year round. So it's not seasonal. Right. And what was the first iteration of it? And how did you even come up with it? So we were watching. So funny enough, I was made, I was a DIYer back in then, do it yourself first. I was making products for myself, for my hair. And I was buying raw materials from Whole Foods and like coming home and mixing them up. From Just me. destroying my kitchen. For- <laughs> from YouTube I'm videos. The, I'm the chef. I really love your relationship. You guys, <laughs> like, the dichotomy is like amazing. From yeah. all over the place. You, stuff, you hate it. It goes, just leave it out. It goes bad on the counter. What like, a- and Whole Foods is not cheap at the time either. It was like, what? Whole Foods right. has never been cheap. You got $300 and you don't even like what you made? This is... <laughs> <laughs> and so I was doing that and we saw an episode of Shark Tank where the lady was doing like organic cookies, but she was putting everything pre-packaged like ready for Crocker in a box and you could make it yourself and know where everything came from, knew it was organic and it was simple and a fail-proof recipe. recipe. Yeah. Yes. So mm-hmm. I was like, I wonder if anyone's doing this for hair because I would totally buy this for like 30 bucks. And then I looked online, I couldn't find anybody doing it. And then I was like, wait a minute, this is probably dumb. If this 2015, this box doesn't exist. And there at the time, there were like a thousand subscription boxes. I was like, okay, I'm not going to do it. And then Tim was like, no, Kim, like, you should just give it a shot. We launch it. I sell one box to my cousin. And I was like, see, such this is dumb. <laughs> Nobody wants this. And then like, he you was- didn't launch it right. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you just, just try again. And so it's funny, at the, same, at the same point in time that she decided to launch it, I just read, I believe it was Ryan Holiday's like confessions of like a media manipulator. And I was like, you know, he has like a whole formula about how you launch, you might want to try it again. Um, but you said Airbnb can relaunch seven times. Yeah. Shirley Cromix can relaunch twice. Yes. So I was yeah. like, fine, I'll try it. And so I ended up reading like uh, Robert Childani's book, um, Influence. Influence. So how to win friends and influence equals well, like six that principles. Was another one. And yep, then I yep. applied those six principles to our website. And I also applied those six principles to pitching journalists. And I looked up, how do you pitch a journalist? Found some journal, um, found some templates and adjusted them. And then also went to buzzsumo.com to figure out who the top journalists were in my category. So for DIY in the last six months. So found the top people, read a few of their pieces of the article, used the template, pitched them with also like a custom intro about the work of theirs that I had read. And then we ended up getting Refinery29 on as our, for our launch. So everybody who had told me no, that was a media company, I went back and traded up the chain and then said, hey, Refinery29 is covering our launch, but I hate for you to miss it. And this is like, Refinery29 was converting like a million followers at the point. So like now they're like really bigger than that. Right. And then they all said yes. So we ended up getting like seven media uh, people to cover our launch and we ended up selling like a hundred boxes on that first day. And that led to a year of revenue in 2017 for 130,000 and the following year, 140,000. But we realized we weren't growing. And mm-hmm. that is when we were like, okay, we're not growing like a subscription box company should grow. And we realized our box was novelty and not necessity. And then also a lot of the DIY companies that were boxes in the industry had started failing or going bankrupt. And I was like, there's not enough profit here. And I found that the profit on our box is only 30%, but we're competing with the hair industry that can sell a bottle for $20, $30, and their margins are 70, 80%. 
there's never, I'll never be able to catch up. And so we ended up realizing we needed to pivot. And that's how we landed on our flaxseed gel, which is our hero product and the thing that we do differently than everybody else. Yeah, and you say you landed there, but Kim took yeah. There's a lot. It took there. us a while to get to that to it's, that flaxseed gel because we were we had tried making products our, on our own. We just couldn't get the flaxseed gel right. But it was the number one seller, like by far. People loved it. Um, we just couldn't figure it out because it's really volatile recipe. It goes bad within like three days. It starts growing mold, and so we couldn't make it shelf stable like a cosmetic product needs to be. So my wife, she's seven months pregnant with our first baby at this time. She spent a month in the kitchen on her feet, just grinding out recipes over and over again. Every it made day. like fifty batches and until we could got something that was stable that we could scale mm -hmm. and do more than sixty in a pot. We could do six hundred, you know, with the machine. And we launched it to our audience and we had sold hundreds in a matter of hours. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we've never launched anything this successfully before. Mm -hmm. This has got to be it. Yeah, so we did a beta, it was 60 bottles. We were like, okay, 60 bottles, cool. Sold that in a couple of minutes. Let's do another 60. Sold that in about an hour, another 60. And then we're like, okay, crap, we actually have to make this now. Um, <laughs> so we ended up doing that beta launch of the flaxseed gel. And then we're like, you know what? This is actually what people want. This could be the next step in our business. So we decided at the top of 2018 to just quit the uh, subscription box business. We had like six boxes lined up. We had all this the inventory in our house. Everything. And we were just like, let's throw it all away. And then we pivoted. And Is it still just you two at that time when you guys are doing this? We have some of our cousins and, and her they little brother for $10 help, an hour help us out yeah, but like, now and again. No, no official anything. Not mm -hmm. even like official contractors, right? Yeah, we're in our kitchen at our apartment. And then we, so in 2018, we pivoted to a traditional e-commerce store. We started selling our flaxseed gel and various fragrances and various oils, right? And then we also turn our best selling boxes, so four of them, into full-size products. So they're just hodgepodge products. They don't necessarily go together, just hodgepodge. And we ended up doing like a million in sales that year. So we wow. went from 140 to like a yeah, million. Like 10X. Years. Yes. Yeah. And then the year after that, um, there are a few things that happened. I can go back. But the year after that, which is last year, we ended up doing 5.5 million. So it's like a 5X jump. So like we've been kind of like, there's, there's a cost with growth, right? Because so much mm -hmm. you don't know. And then right. you have to find that out after the fact. that well, if you had gone a little slower, you maybe have been able to implement some things. Mm -hmm. But now we have like over a, a staff of over 30 people and hopefully on our way to doing 10 million this year. So I'm excited. So in terms of, I mean, so many things there, but at some point, like one of the things that I learned moving from my first business to my next one was I was not thinking big enough. Did that resonate with you? And you're like, yes, when we do this, we're like, even on the pivot, was that something that you guys were like, we need to think bigger? For me, it was reading a, a tremendous amount of books. And I was like, oh, if I had only known this when I was that, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think yeah. the exact moment we, we realized, okay, this could be big, because we 140, we thought, like, oh, yeah, we're doing it. Like, that's almost as much as a salary, right? Like, we're, we're yeah, really yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> uh, and then it was, she went to a comp, that same point where we pivoted, Kim went to a conference called Game Plan from the Traffic Sales and Profit Community, which is led by Lamar Tyler. And I remember I went there, too, with, with the baby. I was up in the hotel room. She was down at the conference. And she came up at the end of one of the days and she was like, there was this lady there and she did $300,000 last year. Oh, could you imagine doing $300,000? Uh, and I was like, That's, that would be nuts. If you could do that, <laughs> that would be, we would be on top of the world. Right? <laughs> I was like, it's $1,000 a day, right? Mm -hmm. And now we make like 20000 or more a day. But, you know, like, it was just funny because back then I was like, if we could just make $1,000 a day, that would be phenomenal, you know? Right. Right. So do you think that you would have had any kind of the success that you're experiencing now with Curl Mix if you hadn't had failed with your social media startup? No, um, we probably would have, we probably would have spun our wheels a lot longer. And then on with and wasted money on clarity. things, yeah, wasted clarity. money on things that we didn't know didn't make money, but we did that. It's like we call it like paying for our MBA, but it was a really cheap MBA, if you will. Yeah, the, the social network game in general is difficult because at the end of the day, it's like there's been a bunch of academic papers around if we can collect data on society and create that as a platform, then we win. And so Facebook was attacking a game where 
almost in the college world they started. And, and if you think about it, you were putting in your name, whether you were single, your ethnicity, what school you went to, what you like, what books you read. And so there's a lot of data. And a venture capitalist who's usually been like an academic trying to study how can we create a social platform to literally digitize humans sees this and goes, oh, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have a clue what he's sitting on. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it just requires a, hundreds of millions of dollars to scale. It, it's a long game. And when it hits, it hits. But, mo, you know, 99.99999% of the time, it's, it's a very, it's very difficult to pull off. And I mean, I don't know how he's done it, frankly, because you can, you can take a wrong turn and, you know, it, it's difficult. You could even get big and then fail at MySpace. Like there, there are so right, many examples right. of why we should not have done it you know, <laughs> in hindsight, right? But, but you but, needed to, to, to yeah. learn those lessons and to be able to learn from them and take curl mix from, you know, 140 to a million in a year. I mean, you, you kind of needed that stepping stone first and foremost to be able to vault your next platform to new and uncharted heights. I mean, you said it yourself. Data is king, and so that's why we won't do retail. We're on, we're staying online because if I if I don't have your phone Smart. number, your email, then this is not useful to me. You know, I don't necessarily, I don't want you to just buy ten dollars from me in a, a Target. You know, that's not enough. I need to be able to continue to sell you over the lifetime of you as my customer. So. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that once you get into these retail stores, they own you. I mean, ultimately, like they can put an order in for 10,000 units today. And then if you don't fulfill that within seven days, they can cancel your entire contract. And if you've sort of projected that, like, oh, I'm going to be used like selling to Target at 10,000 a month. Now you're just sitting on a bunch of inventory. And it's yeah. like, it's like cool. Like, I, I kind of look at it like a vanity metric where it's like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's it can be a necessity. So your family knows you're great, and it's great marketing. Don't get me wrong, but at the end of the day, if it's so, your primary business, it's dangerous because they can cancel anytime. They have way too much leverage over you. Yeah, we just had a I got a good quote from one of our uh, mentors here. He just said, you know, if you go into retail, you're basically doing twice the work for the same amount of money, as right. well as like giving up most of your power. So if, we manufacture. Yeah, so for so us, e-commerce all the way. Yeah, and that's how your costs are so low uh, on, on Shark Tank. But before we get to Shark Tank, at what point did you guys start either, did you raise money and start seeking advice of other people, entrepreneurs, other mentors, venture capitalists? At what point did you start to think about that? So the first person who recommended we um, focus on a flex DJ was actually our advisor. So he had just came on as our advisor and he's like, you know, that's your best selling box, try to make it. And I'm like, so many issues, blah, blah, blah. So we ended up doing like, it. Figure it out. Like, and you never stop selling your best selling you know, product. Um, so we worked with him for, that was the end of 2017. So I've met with him for an hour each month since the top of like January 2018 or really September 2017. But anyway, so we were doing that and somewhere around 2018, that year we made the million. In September, we ended up pitching the Sharks. And that's when we knew we were on track to do a million, but we still weren't really sure. It was our first six-figure month. And we're like, well, if this keeps going the way it's going, like we're definitely going to hit a million at the end of the year. But we weren't, we were still weren't sure. Was your valuation based on the growth rate? And so were you like, oh, if we, if we grow another 10X, we're going to be a $10 million company next year? No, we didn't even, <laughs> our valuation wasn't even, in my opinion, wasn't even that high. We had based it on a million in sales for the year. Yeah. And we had done like a, originally we had went in with like a $7 million valuation. Yeah. And yeah. then the, the shark, not the shark, but the, the people who are advising us around the show suggested that we go lower. So it was like, okay, fine. Like we went lower. We didn't, we followed them on it, but we just ended up just going a little bit lower. Um, we did a $4 million valuation for Robert and Robert's offer was a $2 million valuation. Keeping in mind that we had already made like almost a half a million for the year. And so I was like, this is not fair. I was like, we're not, I was, this sucks. I was like, we're not doing this. And the night before we had made, we had our like walk away numbers. Like we're not going to give up more than 15% of the company. It does not matter what they offer. Uh, it's, it's a hard and fast no. And Robert would negotiate and he asked for 20%. And so we just, we ended up walking away. But later that year, I got offers from like angel syndicates for $7 million valuation mm -hmm. on the same data, you know? And so it was just like, I knew that I was right in that valuation. But we ended up um, getting an offer from the CEO of LinkedIn, Jeff shortly Wiener. after Jeff Wiener. He's a former CEO. He just stepped down yeah. for a million, 1.2 million. And so... I'm skipping backstage capital though. I was just, I was going to go back to it. You can finish. Backstage finish capital story. gave us $25,000 that year. We back when it. we were actually still doing the uh, boxes. They uh, were, okay. first started with us back when we were doing the boxes. That's Arlen Hamilton. 
and she's been a mentor since then. And so they gave us 25K on a convertible note the month that we made $30,000. So in top of 2018, we cut off all the subscription box. We had $3,000 in sales in January. Um, and then by March, we were doing $30,000 a month. And we were just like overwhelmed. We we're like, we don't know what to do. We need, we know we need help. We need, we need money. We need to get out of our kitchen. Um, and Arlen came through with the 25K that helped us move into a new manufacturing facility that allowed us to then scale to that million. Yeah. That's great. To go back to Shark Tank, we had, we had Bad Birdie on recently who actually almost, or did, did deal, deal with Robert specifically. Mm. And he, he was telling us, apparently there's like a, there's a, there's some, I think it's a girl he said that keeps a Google sheet of every single episode, every single person, the valuation and whether it won or not. And basically what he shared with me was every shark cuts your valuation in half. Every single time. That's what they said. It's like, that's exactly what they do. They just cut it in half. And so when he went in, he was prepared for that cut because statistically they were going to do it anyway, no, no matter what you set your valuation to. And if mm, you set it too high, they kind of, they laugh at you. They, so it's not good. But if you set it at something realistic, they're going to cut it in half no matter what, which is interesting. That's good yeah. to know. I wish we had known that at least initially. I'm glad we, we did it though, because trouble. we might have made adjustments to our offer to get a deal mm -hmm. versus right. valuing it at what we personally valued it at. Um, yeah. And ultimately, Mark, uh, Robert said he didn't know anything about the industry. Yeah. So it's like, now, he literally said, I don't know anything about it, but you guys sound like great entrepreneurs. The numbers don't lie. Everything looks good. I want to yeah. make an offer because I believe in you. Um, but I can't really help you. And at that point, we needed more than just money. Like most you gotta new justify the, yeah. yeah. Like most new entrepreneurs or even or even people who don't have like a big network of people, it's the information is almost just as important, if not more important than the money. Like knowing what opportunities are gonna be good or not, or getting the right kind of people in our network, those things have just been just as valuable as any check that we've gotten over the years. So what happened after you guys aired? So you air, what happens to the website? Does it blow up? You get three weeks notice, right? So we okay. had to get like a couple hundred thousand so we could afford inventory. So the month we aired, the month before we aired, we did about 300,000, 295 or something like that in sales. And then the month that we aired, we did about 900,000. Wow, but wow. That was huge. <laughs> However, we also upped our ad spend too, because we knew like the retargeting would be right. valuable. And I think, but our mistake is that we didn't come down from the scale. So it's like you, you have that blip from Shark Tank and you really should yeah. kind of like go back to normal operating procedures. And like we didn't as much. And I think that hurt us ultimately because it was also around primaries. So last year you had like all of the, mm. you know, 26 Democrats, you know, Trump pumped money into Facebook. So like the ads got really, really expensive right. on top of our operations. And I tried to kind of scale the company with Facebook ads. And I learned that that was a mistake. And so now we've um, now we're like way more profitable than we were, were last year, even though we haven't had a shark tank this year, um, which is kind of crazy. So can you share more about that? So when you say, what was it about Facebook that was not working and what did you move the money to? So last year, I think at best we could get like a two X, right. Um, okay. our best team. um, and I want to say it was through the summer and it was like a summer low and it wasn't just me. Like a lot of my friends that run commerce companies are experiencing the same thing. So we're like, Bro, like Facebook ads have gotten so expensive. Like, what the hell? And then we were talking. Then we found out that the, there were 26 Democrats uh, running for office, and there was also Trump was spending like a million a, a week or something. A like week that. or a day, something was crazy. Ads. And I was yeah. like, you know, a black folks use the swing vote too. So, so we were, and that's a part of a large part of who we target as well. Because New York Times did an article on how oh. they were all targeting the black audience, and so my friends who run black companies, we're all, you know, our, wow. our audience is black. So like. The ads got crazy expensive for us to the point where I was probably maybe spending forty-five, fifty dollars per customer, something crazy. Like I don't That's ridiculous. Anymore. So now, and then because it got so bad, like you could barely get a one X. And so we ended up like cutting costs dramatically at the top of the year, and uh, just to kind of like not to be bleeding so much money or having to burn. So we didn't have a burn before we took our investment for a million dollars, right? But then after Shark Tank in the summer hit, and uh, then everybody started campaigning, then we had a burn. And I was like, okay, this is my mistake. I scaled the company with Facebook ads and it shouldn't have. So this year mm -hmm. we kind of flattened the ad spend and we focused on organic growth. Organic growth and hiring people. Because hiring people is how you create the organic growth. And I didn't know that back then. And mm -hmm. so this year we're probably spending maybe like less than fifteen dollars per customer now. And, and six figure profit. Yeah, and we're focusing more on email, SMS, 
And then also, of course, you have recommendations and affiliates, things and referrals. Things like and referrals. Yeah, things where we, we have total control over what we are able to invest in. And now also the ads are like significantly cheaper. Way cheaper right now. Yeah. Today's a good day. Now that all the big <laughs> companies have pulled. Now we're getting like yeah. a seven, eight there's, X, you know. There's arbitrage right now. So in terms of when you say fifteen dollars, you mean fifteen dollars to acquire a new customer? That's yeah. my acquisition cost, yeah. That's amazing. So you're spending three dollars to make it, fifty new acquire, you're selling for thirty, you're 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 netting twelve. We're in the money right now. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thank you. I'm like, trying to get to a million dollar month. We Shark Tank with 900. I'm trying to get to like that seven figure month, but we haven't gotten it yet. So how do you do it? Do you go back on who wants to be a millionaire? Do that quick mill? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? We see that there are new opportunities. So not in, in addition to like how the environment has changed online with e-commerce when it comes to COVID, there's so many new customers now online that weren't shopping online before. I think like the majority of our sales are from brand new people um, who might be shopping online for the first time. And so and like now we only, we don't even go into the store to get groceries anymore. Before we used to go to the grocery store <laughs> twice a month and we spent a few hours there. Now we're literally only ordering on Instacart and that's, mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah. You know? So yeah. we're, we're trying to prepare for this new, I think, I'm, I forget I, who told you. Isolation economy. Yeah. Yes. And so we're trying to gear up to, to meet that kind of demand. And so what's going to happen is as people leave traditional retail, brick and mortar things and start going online, you need yeah. to be able to speak to them and all of their different needs. And so we see an opportunity to expand into new areas as well. China is actually a really good economy if you want to think about the direction of the United States. So China has been 70% in terms of like Instacart grocery delivery, 70% adoption for like the last three years. You, the U.S. was at like 10. I think during COVID, we got to 30, 40 at best. And so when you think about the growth trajectory of economies that have moved forward, like China is the best example of this because they're super early to adopt everything related to technology by force, but it works. It's a good data point, right? And so to your point, totally right. The isolation economy is a real thing. One data point that I have is like, when I order clothes, I hate buying online because I have to, like, what if I have to return it? My wife orders 40 pairs of shoes, returns 38. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? And she's like, I just go to <laughs> FedEx. You know, she just, she's like, what are you talking about? FedEx is right there. And I'm like, but you got to unpack 40 things, try on 40. And, you know, and so there's two markets, right? There's two buyers in the retail space. Right. One group doesn't mind returns. And then me, I mind them. But that's going to change also. So, I'm the person who minds it as well. So kudos to your wife, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's like amazing, frankly. So yeah, the isolation economy is a real thing. That makes a lot of sense. And in terms of just your online marketing, anything uh, driven in relation to like influencer marketing or anything you've gone into education, maybe? What does that look like for you? Okay. That's kind of how we started. So we knew kind of from that first business that content is going to be king for us. So even if you have a great product, you still need to be able to get eyes. And then also, especially if you have something that's relatively new, like us, you have to do a fair bit of education when it comes to the customers, not only learning how to use the product, but understanding why you made made the products that you made, what's in them, how it works. And so that, that's another thing that kind of changed in the hair and beauty industry is people are a lot more conscious about what's going into their bodies and on their bodies. And so we started with a kind of a focus around let's get really small, what we call micro influencers, people with followings of 20,000 or less on Instagram or YouTube and get them on board as revenue share partners. And so they have really, really um, activated fan bases because they're new, people are still really early and dedicated. Um, And so they can speak to them really well. So that's kind of how we started our first- Very smart. Very yeah, our smart. first year of marketing, that's what we focused on. <laughs> and um, then after that, uh, that first year of doing that, we did it for about a year, but then we found out some codes are ending up in like Retail Me Now, and like, people were getting yeah. chaos, and I'm like, that's not fair. So then we kind of like moved that, pulled that back. We're like, okay, we're too big to do this now, this way. But now we're big enough to make our own content too. Right. So now we can afford to put a lot of money into, you know, video productions and influencers and, you know, and, and things like that. Um, but really what's really kind of like brought the business to profitability and really keeps the revenue going coming in regularly is email marketing SMS. Those two things, we have over 350,000 people on our mailing list. Um, wow. and 8,000 people we've suppressed. So uh, over 400,000 in total. That's massive. Um, 
that's that's the money is in the email. Is so it like a ten percent click rate or, or like purchase rate? Where are you guys at on that? Um, it depends on so what two hundred thousand total customers. So yeah, they don't the always come from that list. Yeah. Um, I have to double check with our CMO to figure out what those click through rates are. I, I wouldn't know them offhand. CMO, uh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, this is another level. You got to keep going up. Uh, well, she was promoted like six months ago. Mm-hmm. Not that new, maybe was, a little bit. Uh, six months. I don't even remember. So QVC is QVC calling. When when uh, what's going to happen next? What's your, what's your next like big bump? So that actually QVC HSN is was in the works for us, but it's, it's mm. at the exact point in time where we were going to do it is like that's when everything started shutting down. So they're literally. I think now they've moved to doing skyping people in um yeah. but there was like a moratorium on people but they've already classes. called so we're just they, <laughs> yeah. so we're probably doing know. next year yeah um they just told yeah. us to let them know when we're ready you know um and then we just know we need a moment to kind of like yeah. we have other plans point, work, we're working on right yeah, now. at this point let's my talk heart, about that yeah being the coo at this point is my hardest job is like getting off back order like i remember saying yeah. this on shark tank and that's it's like, right you said it on shark tank yeah Again. I was like, what a great pitch. What a great thing to say. Oh, our problem is we can't, we can't hold our stock. It just goes away. Exactly. <laughs> and so now I'm still trying to get off back order. We were off back order for months and now we're back on it because we, in, I think it was the beginning of March is when they started doing a lot of the shutdowns and then people started shopping online. And then we also had a, a, a rerun of Shark Tank Air. And mm-hmm. then on that same, same time, we had a rerun uh, a lot of Instagram pages decide to post our story and then they got a retweet from Chance the Rapper and we just, our sales just exploded. But the biggest issue is that because China experienced COVID, they make everybody's right. plastic bottles. Right. And so in the beauty industry, right? It's just crunch. Yes, it's it crushed a lot of people because hand sanitizer, right? People are making this hand sanitizer and like these hand gel, whatever, these cleaning supplies. And literally in the big companies are like buying up all the stock of it. Um, so that they can almost like kind of compete, if you will. You know, if you can buy um, a couple million bottles, you'll make sure that the people who are smaller than you don't get them. So you're the ones on the shelves and they're not, you know. That's All that strategy. happened within like two weeks for us. And we, we started making mm-hmm. our own shampoo conditioner. Oh, within like two weeks. And so we got like two weeks behind on orders. And now we're working our way back up to now what we used to be able to do was like two day shipping. So we're down from 10 days or more to now to like five, six days. So we're just trying to get back to a normal shipping rate. And so, and as also marketing is trying to like take the brakes off. It's like, like you said, it's arbitrage. They're like, can we spend more money? Yeah. So like, we can't <laughs> ship more products. What are you guys seeing around ROAS and paid advertising? So for us, it's a little bit different. I mean, for us, it's, you know, the goal isn't revenue for us. The goal is like, we're really taking almost that social network approach where it's all about listeners. It's all about downloads. It's all about reach. Ultimately, it's also about trying to help the company. And so the companies that come on, let's say you're specialized in Chicago and you make something in Chicago, you have a big fan base there, then we'll throw ads at it in Chicago just to kind of educate you. And so for us, the ROI is is measured a little bit differently. When we started the podcast, I'm a real estate developer, Nick's in video production. My wife who's usually on the podcast is in construction. And so as much as we're all entrepreneurs and doing our own thing, um, it was really about how do we just create value for the entrepreneur and, and help. And so whether that's, you know, it's funny, we had somebody came on the podcast and they had sold their company to GoDaddy. So seven years later, right? And it was the first time that the investor had heard the full story of that company when we released the podcast. Mm. And so it's just like, it's crazy to think about that, but we've at least seen, you know, things like that happen. And so for us, we're really just in the growth phase of this. How big can we get the audience? We've had some people reach out to us in terms of wanting to do ads, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with the ethos of it. Totally fine. I don't think it makes much sense. I was thinking maybe some other folks have told you guys what, what they were getting because yeah. you know you were saying that they're lower than they ever been in your arbitrage. I was like, yeah, they are. It's crazy. In addition to trying to scale our operations to kind of fit with that the new economy, we want to make sure that you know we can take advantage of those new opportunities as well. Yeah, one of the things that's come up a lot in this interview, and I want to circle back to it. You mentioned at the beginning that you know you're both from the south side of Chicago. Not a lot of entrepreneurs in your life as examples, and when you went on Shark Tank, you were looking for more of the information than the money. And I wanted to see if you guys had thought about or even taken action at this point to, because you are probably 
one of like the better examples, shining examples for the Chicago area of uh, what an entrepreneur can be. And especially going back to your neighborhoods, have you thought about ways that you can kind of give back and educate that next generation of entrepreneurs? Oh, absolutely. And we do tons of free speaking events in our neighborhoods whenever we're asked to speak at schools. We also employ people from our community. So like, you know, we pay them $17 an hour starting, which is like double minimum wage, which is like nine or something. And then we also are trying to get a manufacturing building in one of the poorest areas in Chicago. So that, that will create more jobs and raise the property values in the area, but also bring other businesses who be more comfortable coming when they see larger businesses buying real estate in those areas. Yeah. So we do, a, I feel like a good yeah. amount and of one, of one of our things that's close to our heart is one of the, one of the, comp, the sorry, nonprofits we work with is called the Gray Matter Experience. Yeah. So they take kids from CPS, typically um, minority children from CPS, and they get them starting a new business. So they take them from nothing to starting a new business. In high school. Um, in, while they're still in high school. And so we, we work really closely with them. And we've to done help. lots of free speaking events with them. So these these kids and, and the people that you hire, I mean, that, that's first, that's amazing. Kudos Thank to you guys. I had heard that you guys had opened up your facility in Chicago, but I didn't quite know the extent of the levels that you were going to enrich the community and build it up. One thing for me, you know, just to share some personal story for me, it's like um, when I, when I was born in Peru. And so we, when we came here from Peru, so we landed in Massachusetts, it was like, there was no examples of a Peruvian that had made it right. They didn't exist. And you can look in any arena, you could look in sport. You couldn't, if I was like, Hey, name a professional Peruvian in the NBA or any sport, you'd be like, uh, no, they don't exist. Right. And so it's like, for me, the problem that I'm trying to solve is that. And so it's like, I have to be that person so that when my nieces, nephews, family members, community, right, when they see, oh, Diego's doing it, we can too. He looks like me. We can do it too. Absolutely. And so that's like the, the constant driver for me. And I think, I think as minorities, we share that, right? It's like you have this intrinsic thing that you're like, I have to make this because it's bigger than me. Yes, that's, that has been... And for any moment that I thought the business was going to fail, that I would want to quit because this is hard. I was like, you know, my story isn't for me. You know, my story isn't for me. Yeah. I, I can even tell you how many people we've probably inspired and have, will go on to be successful entrepreneurs. And that makes me so, it's so satisfying. You know, it makes it, it's more than about the money that we've made or what we're doing right here. So the jobs and then the inspiration of people who come behind us. I love it. Well, listen, I appreciate you guys coming on the podcast. Tell everyone where they can find you. You guys can find us at chromix.com or chromix on any of our social media. If you're looking to like work with us directly, because I know you guys kind of talk to entrepreneurs. Um, we do do consultations sometimes, Kim and Tim Lewis uh, And yeah, thank you for listening. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, this has yeah, honestly easily been too. one of the most creative uh, journeys of entrepreneurship. <laughs> and I, we I love it. We a lot it. of topics that we've never heard on this show before. <laughs> sure. We have a very unconventional. If they want to learn how to get on who wants to be a millionaire. <laughs> but it just goes, you got to think outside the box when it comes to fundraising for your company. It doesn't always have to come That is next PC level, though. Or that is like, yeah. <laughs> that is so <laughs> next level. Like, the traditional avenues weren't available to us. Like we couldn't convince anyone to give us money. We couldn't win any of the competitions we entered. I've never won a fish competition, not yeah. for money anymore, which is crazy. We didn't win right? anything. I've won one. And honestly, it's like, they say it's 50,000. And by the time you read the fine print, it's like a $5,000 check and it's 45,000 of services like legal <laughs> and office. So it's honestly a complete, it looks really good. It's not, it's yeah. not yeah. at all good. Well, thank, well, you, guys thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. You bet. Thank you, guys.